Data transfer or moving data from one computer to another is very important in data-driven engineering. So let's say I have a computer here, computer one, and I need to get data over to computer two. So many different ways of doing that. And computer one and two, those could also be, you know, uh, mobile phones or a human machine interface, a display for an operator to look at. It's any time you need to get data from one to the other. So let's talk about a couple that are used in industrial control applications like Modbus. So let's start with this one. This one's an older technology created in 1979. And this one, Modbus, is really good if you need something that's just fast and efficient but it can only send uh, zeros or ones, okay? Those are binary, they call them coils. Or you can send 16-bit numbers. All right, and each one uh, occupies an address, and there's particular addresses for read-only or read-write. Now, this is really good for programmable logic controllers and other devices that have been set up with this interface. So it gives you an interface to be able to read or write to that PLC. Now, some other types of control systems as well, such as distributed control systems and others also use this. Some instruments like analyzers also use Modbus. So very reliable, very fast, very simple application interface to be able to move data between two computers. Now, the next one I'll talk about is MQ TT. Now, this one is really popular in the Internet of Things area where you have a broker and multiple clients that either publish their data or subscribe. Okay, I'll have another client here that is subscribing. Okay, subscribe to the data, or you can have the client both publish and also subscribe to other values. Okay, so the, the nice thing about this is it gives you this way to create these ad hoc networks with this broker here in the middle. So even if one of the clients goes down, you still maintain the other applications that need to be able to receive information. So for example, let's say you had a thermostat in your house and this client is publishing temperatures. And then another one that uh, communicates with your solar panels, for example, and uh, tells, and maybe the battery bank as well, maybe you have a, other things like moisture sensors or other things that all communicate together. And all of them need to be able to work together in this ad hoc network. So MQTT is very good for these. Uh, not necessarily uh, designed for high speed or large data transfer can do that, but it's, it's good for you know, getting data from one device to the other. All right, so you can also send, the nice thing about this as opposed to Modbus, okay, you can also send images. You can also send audio files. You can send other types of data. So it's very flexible in what you send with MQTT. All right, the next one that we're going to be talking about is OPC UA. All right, I'll give this a different color here. All right, so OPC UA. It's universal architecture. So it replaced OPC DA and OPC HDA. So historical data access or um, the d data access that was built on the DCOM object from Microsoft. It wasn't really cross-platform flexible. So this is the old standard right here. And the new one, OPC, UA, Universal Architecture, it allows you to run on Linux or Windows, and it's much more flexible. You can also do large file transfer, images, um, audio, just like MQTT. And it's really built for these industrial control networks where you might have uh, many computers, um, and maybe like a display, maybe uh, something like a historian right here and uh, maybe something like a distributed control system 
that gives you access to all of your instruments. And so it's a way to efficiently move values back and forth in these industrial automation environments. And it's very flexible. So if you also add a new measurement, you can configure that. There's very good browsers to show you the hierarchy of the data and it's collected in an organized way. All right, the, the last one that I'll talk about, this one is probably the most flexible. It's like a underlying level that some of these other ones use. So for example, MQTT, one of the options is use a WebSocket as the underlying layer to transfer that data. So this one is really just the raw ingredient of how you move data from one to the other. And the nice thing about WebSockets uh, is that you can configure your client or server to act in any way you want. So sometimes it's a, ser a server that just you know stores information, waits for a request, and then pushes a response back. And sometimes it's a client where it's sending information and then it, listening for a response. Uh, but it, it gives you this much more flexible architecture for doing this data transfer. And it's very fast. So basically, you're stripping away a lot of the, the interface that some of these like MQTT and others offer, and you're programming it kind of at a raw level. Now, uh, WebSockets are also fairly uh, flexible. They're, they're good for these different types of networks, but it's a lot more programming that you have to do to configure it. The, the other nice thing about WebSockets is that you can write WebSockets in, um, you know, in Python, you can write it in JavaScript, uh, PHP. There's many different programs that support WebSockets. So it allows you to communicate uh, through many different types of programming languages. Okay, so uh, probably the best supported out of all those in terms of if you have some obscure platform that you're trying to get the data to or uh, from, a WebSocket might, might be a good choice. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about um, a little bit is uh, just how you send your data. All right, so there's, there's kind of different ways to do this. One is you collect all your data and send it as a batch. Okay, so from one computer and it's maybe on this network and then you have to send it to uh, computer two. And then you collect that little by little. And then when it's full or a certain time um, expires, then you send this whole block over to the other computer. Now, the other way of doing this is through streaming, okay? And where you send the numbers as they come. So you could either do batch or you can stream it, okay? So a stream as the number comes in, you send it and then you store maybe the latest value of that. And then as the next one comes in, you send that one as well. And sometimes you just replace the current value so that when you another computer asks for that information, then it's always just collecting what is the current value of that temperature or pressure or whatever you need it uh, to, you need to transfer. Okay, so that's uh, streaming. There's different ways of doing it. One is uh, TCP, all right? And that is good for ensuring that the data is going to make it there. So that is good for something like uh, batch transfer, uh, where you need to ensure that if this gets disconnected, that it's going to continually retry until it sends the data. So it, it focuses on completeness and data integrity that all of it arrives. Another standard is the UDP. Uh, UDP. All right, so that one is user diagram protocol versus transmission control protocol. Now this one is better for something like if you have a, a, a live webcam and you're trying to stream that. Now, you don't necessarily want to buffer and try to replay some of the old data. As new data comes in, if it got broken, you just want to send the most recent. So this one, you can stream values and, 
And if something drops, uh, it doesn't try to continually retry to send the data that dropped. It'll just move on to the latest data. So that would be, for example, like if you had a live stream going on, a video feed, something like that. You just want the latest values. And if it gets disconnected, you don't want to try to transfer that again. All right. So um, also I want to talk about some other options as well. Now, one that I did not mention here, and this could have been a fifth, I almost included it here, uh, but is ROS, Robot Operating System. And this is very good if you have uh, a robot, a device, you know, where it might have particular functions, maybe a webcam or, you know, a gripper or something like that. Maybe it's a UAV, uh, a drone and you have all these components that need to be able to share information. So that's like a, a robot operating system is a very efficient um, operating system that is able to exchange information for computer vision, for other types of things. It's a little harder to use, but um, also it is a, a very nice way to, you know, especially for robotics applications to be able to share information, kind of like MQTT. Uh, where you have this uh, broker, a publish subscribe model uh, that, that moves information. Okay, so let's talk about a couple others as well. Um, and I, I just want to talk about um, some of the APIs that are out there. Okay, and, and so as you can imagine, in uh, you know, on the web, there's many applications of being able to move data, you know, maybe from a server in a server farm out to a user, uh, you know, that has a cell phone. Okay. Uh, or maybe somebody is at a laptop. All right. And they are typing information. And so you have these, these, uh, protocols, the API, uh, it stands for Application Programming Interface. And you see this a lot where you have services or APIs that, you know, maybe you want to send a photo, okay, send a photo to a server, and then be able to share that with others, okay, so like a file sharing type application. And you might have some kind of an API to be able to upload photos to the server so that they can be shared with others. Okay, so that'd be like for cloud hosting, you know, uh, storage or maybe a service like you upload a photo and then maybe you want to be able to remove, uh, you know, remove the background from it. And we'll have an application of that in, uh, in the course. Um, so there's a lot of different services, you know, where you can uh, operate, do some computing. Uh, and so I just want to review three of the most popular for APIs, for creating APIs. So the first one is uh, REST. And REST is representational state transfer. It's a software architecture for these APIs. And it's a stateless architecture um, where what you've sent or completed doesn't store a history of that. It's like just a service that you're... Um, providing and it has very specific functions now it's really used for the the crud okay and this stands for uh, create read update delete well web applications that are well structured so you give it a very specific uh, type of API now Python uses bottle or flask framework for these small web applications to provide these services and typically the clients are going to be doing requests over HTTP or HTTPS, and they communicate a lot of times with JSON files. Uh, it's a human readable structured data. All right, so these are good for small web applications and for prototyping. Uh, when it's a very popular one, it's very easy to configure and very good support over many different platforms. I want to talk about two others as well. You know, kind of for higher performance, uh, you might use something like uh, GraphQL. Uh, that's an open source query language uh, that has defined data structures. And it's a client-driven 
where the client uses strongly typed these schemas that are very uh, organized. It's really um, built for these public interfaces that need to be flexible and customizing requests from different sources, uh, but not as efficient as something like the GPRC. Uh, okay, GPRC is a lightweight, efficient protocol that uh, for obtaining data, it relies on contracts or in the relationship between the server and the client. So it's a little bit more structured, and this one is good for public APIs. And this one's just a little less flexible. It's good for private APIs, where you have control of both the client and um, you know the server. And, and and you know exactly the kind of data you need to be sending. And so it creates these contracts. It's very efficient, especially if you need to move a lot of data and uh, where, where performance is very important. Okay, so REST would be for like, uh, you know, prototypes. Very flexible, easy to configure. Uh, public APIs and then private APIs. Now, there are instances where you have very specific interfaces as well. And if you think about like automotive, um, I just want to show you a couple examples of that on the web page that we have for this. Okay. Uh, here we have connections to automobiles, for example, through an OBD2 connection. And there's an example here in the machine learning class where it shows how to use these devices that can connect over OBD2. Uh, OBD2 connection to be able to collect data from the automobile. And so you'll see some data that's collected. It's just a standard interface that most of the automotive applications use. And also for off-road vehicles, you might use a J1939 uh, instead uh, of the uh, automotive one. And most of the off-road vehicles, heavy equipment, use this one. So you can either have these customized interfaces that you can customize or industry standard ones where an industry body has decided on the API and it's very specific to that equipment. So let me come back here to the course website. All of this is given in this overview. And then we're going to get more into each one where we have Modbus, MQTT, the OPC UA and WebSockets. And so if you select each one, you'll see Modbus, and then you'll see MQTT, and here you have OPC UA, and then finally, uh, WebSocket. So videos and more information for each of these, and this is all part of the data-driven engineering course. I hope you enjoy it.